A theme you will undoubtedly come to know on this channel is that many of the movies that I review are ones that I saw in the rental store as a kid and watched later as I got older. I miss being able to walk through a movie store and physically hold a VHS tape or a DVD in my hand. I love the fantastical designs and impossible graphics. I remember making decisions to rent a movie based on front cover art alone. Two movies stood out to my 8 year old self. A pair of movies that would have amazing cover art, obtain cult movie status, and both involve killer plants. One would exceed my expectations based on the cover art, and the other would disappoint because it couldn't live up to the hype. And that movie was the 1978 cult comedy classic, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. So sit back and let's take a bite out of the fearful fruit and see if my disappointment was justified. Well, this is a simple one. Killer tomatoes of all shapes and sizes show up and run amok, and an elite team is sent in to deal with it. Okay, there's actually a lot more than that, but it just gets really weird and awkward, like finding a rotten tomato in the back of the fridge. Well, they got me there. If you're feeling brave, keep watching. If not, you can skip ahead. The film opens up with a message running across the screen about how when Alfred Hitchcock made Birds, everyone laughed until something happened just like it. This sets the tone for the rest of the movie going forward. I think this is what initially threw me for a loop the first time I was watching the movie. I was expecting much more emphasis on the killer tomatoes and not the schlock comedy, but I'll get to that later. The next scene opens up with a young woman washing dishes when she's suddenly attacked by a tomato rising up out of her sink drain. She screams and the screen fades to the opening credits, complete with splattering tomatoes and an over-the-top silly song. We return to the kitchen where the police are investigating and then we are treated to a montage of people being attacked by tomatoes. The carnage continues as speeding police cars head towards the secret USDA test field where officers are engaged in a gunfight with hordes of tomatoes. After a kamikaze tomato takes down a helicopter, the Ag Department head and the Press Secretary of the United States survey the scene. Shortly after, a meeting is held with less prominent generals and scientists and an operative named Mason Dixon that hasn't worked since the Bay of Pigs. Yikes. They discuss how they will combat the tomatoes and during the sequence we are served up some ridiculously low brow humor. And I mean brow, complete with the umlauts. The worst of which is when a scientist uses an extremely offensive slang term to describe the tomatoes. Look, I'm not even going to say it. I don't monetize these videos, but I might get to one day, and that would land me a big old strike. Which reminds me, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Now where was I? Oh yeah, I get that it was a different time, and maybe sensibilities were a little different. Or maybe they just had a bead on the fact that B-movies often contain inflammatory content. Huh. Either these guys are total morons or complete geniuses. I'll let you decide. Put your thoughts in the comments. Next we meet our crack team of specialists. A black undercover agent who's wearing a white plastic nose from a gag shop. A beefy German Olympian girl who defected from West Berlin. An underwater expert who never takes off his diving gear and the last operative is parachuting in, so the rest of the team need to go meet him. They pile into a car that's marked unmarked. I can't believe I'm explaining this. That's the kind of joke I laughed at in grade three. Dixon literally drops his team members off in the middle of nowhere, and each time the undercover guy is disguised as someone different, from Abe Lincoln to Adolf Hitler? Wow, just wow. Either these guys had a premonition of what awkward humor in the first season of The Office would be like 50 years later, or they're satirizing the genre again. I really can't decide. It's a serious problem. It's keeping me up at night. <laughs>
Shortly after, Lieutenant Moron parachutes in. Yeah, he has a name, but I'm not using it. Lieutenant Moron is fine. No, really, it's fine. So Lieutenant Moron tries to kill the undercover guy because, you know, Hitler. And Dixon stops him and sends the undercover guy to go get intel on the tomatoes and him and Lieutenant Moron drive off. Next, the press gets involved, and in a hailstorm of misogyny, which I'm not even going to touch, a young female reporter named Lois is given the task to report on the tomatoes and told to make sure she uses all her potential. Again, it's really awkward, and it's hard to say if it's played for laughs or satire. Another tomato montage, and then back to the press secretary, who's been tasked to connect with the ad agency that got the president elected. Here we're treated to the first of two musical numbers, and it comes out of nowhere. I mean, really, out of nowhere. He just starts singing. There's an awkward intercut sequence between reporter Lois, her boss, Dixon, and Lieutenant Moron. Dixon tells Lieutenant Moron to go to bed because he's tired, and reporter Lois's boss tells her to go use all her potential. Don't worry, Lois. Me too is on the way in about 50 years. There's a whole subplot that involves a press secretary trying to kill Dixon. While Dixon is trying to escape, he is chased by a tomato, and he escapes a grisly fate when he enters a kid's room and he's listening to a song called... <sighs> Puberty Love. And the tomato just launches itself out the window. Dixon is captured and confronted by the press secretary, who's trying to capitalize on the tomato invasion so he can take over the country. The tomatoes don't bother him because he's got a garden, and it contains tomatoes, so that makes him in tune with them for... reasons. The press secretary is soon cut down by Lieutenant Moron, just before revealing how he's in control or... something. And then Dixon realizes that the song... Puberty Love... is the tomato's weakness. He and Lieutenant Moron round up the remaining people into a football stadium, and when the tomatoes surround them, they play Puberty Love, and all the tomatoes shrink. The crowd charges and stomp the tomatoes. For reasons, Lois is there and is about to be eaten by the last giant tomato wearing earmuffs. You heard right. Dixon shows the tomato the lyrics and the music for puberty love it shrinks away and they escape and fall in love like you do so you're probably wondering what happened to the rest of the team while Greta the Russian defector German Olympiad meets her end in the forest when she's attacked by several tomatoes Lieutenant Moron shows up and tells her there's tomato activity in the vicinity after she's dead you know what Lieutenant Moron has been promoted to Captain Obvious the scuba guy takes a swim in a fountain and is never seen or heard from again. I guess we can assume the tomatoes got him, but nobody ever knows. The disguise expert is sitting around a campfire eating a sandwich and then asks for ketchup. Oh, whoa, 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 hold it. He's sitting around a campfire with man eating tomatoes and he's eating a sandwich. What is it with this guy? I mean, seriously, how does he get the most offensive writing? Again, I can't decide if this is satire or stupidity. There's also a whole sequence of like combat scenes where tomatoes are attacking a city and like there's a second musical number, but I'm not explaining it. This has gone on way too long. Okay, let's clear the air here. I'm not saying that Attack of the Killer Tomatoes is a bad movie. It attained cult status and launched three sequels, an animated cartoon, and a ton of merch, including video games. Return of the Killer Tomatoes even has a young George Clooney in it. We have to look at the movie as arguably one of the first satire pieces created to mock pop culture. Today, comedy films like Scary Movie mock pop culture with impunity. Arguably, the hit comedy Airplane, which does the exact same thing as Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, set the standard for B-movie and pop culture satire, and it wouldn't come out for another two years. 
National Lampoon was busy releasing Animal House and was working on disco beavers from outer space. Hmm, that one sounds right up my alley. What I'm trying to say is, there was no real pattern or form to follow. And since the film wasn't associated with any major studio, there was no one to stop them. There's a ton of mockery of government services and the President of the United States. Which makes sense. Richard Nixon had resigned in disgrace a few years earlier. Gerald Ford wasn't popular because of his pardon of Nixon. When the movie was made, Jimmy Carter was president, who wasn't that popular going into office and even less popular going out. The Cold War was at a low point, with various nuclear arms treaties happening, and the war in Vietnam was over. And to top it off, there was a huge energy crisis. No wonder they marked their government this way. It might also be the reason for the irreverent humor. During the 1970s, one of the main public perceptions was that America had lost its way. And the lowbrow humor? It's probably just another way to show it. What's interesting about Attack of the Killer Tomatoes as a series is that it seemed to have invaded pop culture in very subtle ways. As a kid, I remember it referenced in the Disney after-school cartoon Darkwing Duck as Attack of the Mutant Rutabagas. The show also would have a villain who was a scientist who was turned into half-duck, half-plant. They would also feature a giant potato in the episode Night of the Living Spud. Nice take on another B-movie horror cult classic, Night of the Living Dead. Futurama would also have a background character mention that when he was frozen, giant carrots ruled the earth. Perhaps a nod to the end of the movie when a carrot pops up out of the soil? While it seems pretty obvious that I'm not a huge fan of the humor of the movie, that perception is not true. The sections of the movie I've called attention to are only a small percentage of the movie's runtime, and I actually do enjoy the rest of the movie, although it is one I have to be in the right mood for. The music is actually one of the best things in the movie. The opening theme is well done and captures the over-the-top nature of the 50s B-movie feature perfectly, from the music right up to the font choice and the splattering tomatoes. Even the two musical numbers, the first being the ad exec who does a number about why they do what they do, and the second is just before the tomatoes attack an army base. The soldiers are doing a song and dance routine, and it's reminiscent of a 1940s war film. The movie has lots of little gags that are well done, like when reporter Lois tries to interview Dixon, and a guy walks by and says, hello. Lois says, hi Kent. And as he walks out of frame, you can see a red cape start to fall out of his suit jacket. The way the tomatoes are filmed is pretty good. It's a nice nod to the B-movie classics with reverse photography and varying camera speed. There's an actual helicopter crash that was a total accident, but with some clever cuts and improvised dialogue, it plays really well with the scene. I also enjoy the miniature tanks and cityscapes. It's a nice nod to the old B-movie creature features. But my favorite visual is the one of a tomato that's about the size of a beach ball and it's chained to a tree stump with scientists and soldiers studying it. What's hard to take is some of the humor. Captain Obvious is the best example. A lot of his stuff is supposed to be played for laughs and a lot doesn't come off too well. He just seems too... stupid. I know that one of the main comedy ideas is that the audience loves a slow thinker, but this guy defies that handily. The first time he meets reporter Lois is when she breaks into his bedroom and he thinks she's a hooker. I mean, really? That's where you go? The next time he meets her, he tries to kill her. And the only reason she escapes is he gets tangled up in a parachute that he's always wearing. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, my initial viewing was disappointing. The cover art showed a menacing tomato and the tagline was "Arg," But none of the tomatoes have faces. And there's a lot, a lot of dumb humor. Watching it later, I've come to appreciate the film for the satire and I do enjoy watching it. I'd have to give it a grade B marbled cheddar. It's a mixed bag of clever satire and lowbrow humor. But if you can get past that, it's a fun film to snack on. My name is Ryan. Thanks for watching. 
Like, share, and subscribe. And don't forget, you can't spell cheese without a B.